You're listening to the LA Football Podcast. Los Angeles, what's going on? Welcome to the LA Football Show here on the LA Football Network, your destination for Los Angeles football. This is your UCLA Bruins segment as they welcome the Stanford Cardinal to the Rose Bowl. Make sure to like and subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts, Apple, Spotify, Google Play, Stitcher, wherever you get your podcasts. We are also on YouTube. We actually launched team-specific YouTube channels. We got the LAFB Network channel, and then you got UCLA LAFB. You got USC LAFB. Not that anyone out there listening to this show cares about that, but we got Rams and Chargers also. And obviously, you can find everything in one spot, and that is LAFBnetwork.com. So make sure to give those all a gander. Like, subscribe, um, retweet, whatever you got to do. We certainly appreciate it. Joining me, as always, it was his birthday just a few days ago. We are celebrating during the Bruins game, hopefully a Bruins victory as well. But my man, the madman, Jamal Madney, what's up, brother? Happy Friday. How are we doing today? Doing well, Ryan. Excited to get into the weekend obviously the beloved bruins are playing tomorrow having a birthday party tomorrow you and the missus are going to be there so excited about that we're going to celebrate watch some good football so it should be a great weekend both on the field as well as off the field and excited to get into this conversation and finally put the bad taste from eugene oregon away and we can talk about new things turn the page smell the roses and uh, kind of enjoy ourselves here over the next 20 or 30 minutes. Yes. The uh, today is the 100th anniversary of the Rose bowl. Pretty sweet. 1922 is when the Rose bowl was constructed here in beautiful Pasadena today, celebrating the hundredth anniversary. I did a, um, I did this series Jamal for fun. Uh, and I need to pick back up. I just, I just don't have any time. Um, but it was like a, a storytelling series where I kind of took events in history and took real life events, uh, real things that happened. But then I kind of, I wouldn't say fictionalized it, but created fictional characters around that event. And I did one about the Rose Bowl and about the the starting of the Rose Bowl in 1922. So I did a lot of research about it and kind of why the city chose it, where UCLA used to play before then. I mean, obviously UCLA didn't go to the Rose Bowl in 1922. It was much later than that, but just the history of it. And it's such an iconic venue. And I know there's been talks about the, the annoyance of, you know, UCLA playing 40 minutes from campus, but when you really sit down and think about it, I mean, it's pretty damn cool. They get to play every Saturday at arguably a top five venue, not only in the country, but in the world. Oh, no doubt about it, Ryan. And I remember listening to that beautiful story that you shared about the Rose Bowl and it was absolutely incredible. And it was just your voice and the intricacy of the characters and the sounds and the colors and the noises and all of the unique nuances and idiosyncrasies that the Rose Bowl represents and has you brought to life. And there is, there is arguably no greater venue in the history of college football than the Rose Bowl, a game in Pasadena under the San Gabriel Mountains at 5 p.m. with those colors, those shades of pink, those hues of purple and all of that. It looks like a Rembrandt painting. You know, it looks like something out of the Renaissance. Uh, There's nothing like it. And, you know, you forget all about the traffic and you forget all about the, you know, the noises that lead you there. And you forget all about the noise, about the amount of crowd that's there and what have you. And you sit in those seats and you get to experience that atmosphere. Really nothing like it at all. Ryan, we've talked about it. I think Boulder is a very special place. I think Seattle is very special in the Pac-12. Obviously, the the big house and the shoe and some of the great places in the sec like Tennessee and Ole Miss and um, places like that LSU and death Valley with Clemson. I mean, just beautiful places of college football and the Rose bowl is right up there. If not at the very top of, of, of that venue and that experience, given what it represents, the history, the city, the weather, the vibe, and uh, just, it's always a privilege to, to watch the Bruins play in that stadium. Hard to believe it opened in 1922. UCLA as, a, as an institution started in 1919, and it took uh, nearly 60 years, uh, 64 years to be exact, for uh, UCLA to then play in the Rose Bowl. It was after the 83 season. And it was really the good <clears throat> luck charm for UCLA to play in the Rose Bowl 
Terry Donahue wins three Rose Bowls in his first four years at the Rose Bowl. And, and that was really, uh, you know, made the christening of that experience uh, so great. And we're hoping this year they they make it back and they win for the first time since those Donahue re- years. And, and wouldn't it be so fitting and beautiful if they could do it for the centennial birthday? Yeah, it was. Um, I thought it was clever. Obviously, this is the Bruins segment, but this is still the L.A. football show. Uh, USC tweeted out today, uh, happy birthday to our second home, which uh, <laughs> you, could, you could say it as a slant at UCLA, but I think it was more so just that they, they played a lot of Rose Bowls over their history. So, And they play every other year in the Rose Bowl. So I thought that was clever. But um, yeah, just such an iconic venue in Los Angeles, which we have no so doubt. many. No doubt, uh, Ryan, we have so many. And I, I think that's very clever. I mean, I see 34 Rose Bowl appearances, 25 Rose Bowl victories, far and away. Uh, greater than any other school. So I think they have the right to stick to call that the second home. Uh, yeah. So it's, it's USC's second home and it's UCLA's first home. And let's see if it can be UCLA's first home on New Year's Day. I think that's the question. Yes, exactly. Which whew, everything's still in front of them. We talked about it last week. Uh, the, the cards are still in their hand to play. They just have to play them correctly. It all starts on Saturday. Unfortunately, another 7 30 p.m. kickoff time. So we miss those beautiful hues and painted uh, mountaintops because it'll be dark by then. Uh, but if you're tailgating, you will get to see them. Uh, but Stanford Cardinal travel down three and four coming into this game. Very banged up football team. Uh, this is always a good game. Uh, UCLA's, you know, played ve- well. Even the Chip Kelly years have played fairly well against Stanford overall. I remember that uh, the, the tough year with Joshua Kelly, but he came out roaring against Stanford to the tune of 200 plus yards. Dimitri Felton had some good games against Stanford. So overall, these Chip Kelly teams have played well against Stanford historically in this era, era, whatever you want to call it. Um, but now this is a game where coming off a tough loss to Oregon, they need to rebound in the right way, get things right. Stanford, as I mentioned, banged up, but still a well-coached team. Thoughts on this game from the get-go, and then we'll jump into kind of defensive matchups and stuff like that. But what are you looking at as this game starts on Saturday? Yeah, right. It's such an interesting matchup here with Stanford. And even historically, Stanford won 11 in a row from 2009 to 2019. You know, the Hundley era was defined by beating USC and going 3-0 against USC, but going 0-4 against Stanford and denying some of those Hundley teams an opportunity for more in terms of conference championship success. And then, you know, the tide has turned in terms of the last three years with UCLA winning two of the last three. But what's so interesting is that UCLA has not beaten Stanford at the Rose Bowl since 2008 when Kevin Kraft was the quarterback of the Bruins and he threw a game-winning touchdown pass with 10 seconds left to win that game 23-20. to 20. So a lot of interesting sort of historical anomalies when it comes to this rivalry. Ryan, going into this game from a, from a matchup perspective and just initial thoughts, how the Bruins bounce back for me is going to be critical. Uh, both USC and UCLA are coming off losses. USC had the luxury of having a bye. UCLA did not. So how does that mindset shift to, okay, we're 0-0 and and we're starting the next win streak. You know, one of the things that have defined UCLA football in the 21st century is even when they get off to fast starts in seasons, they're followed by losing streaks. In, you know, 2001, they started 6-0, and finished 7-4, and lost 4 of 5. In 2005, they started 8-0, and proceeded to lose two of their next three games. Even the great 98 season started 10-0, and lost their last two. So how does UCLA really find that focus, dial it in, and say, we won nine in a row, we started 6-0 and this year, we, we had a tough outing at Eugene, how do we reset the deck and really dig back into those habits that allowed us to go 6-0? and And for me, it starts with Dorian Thompson-Robinson, who's been so exceptional this season. But I saw, Ryan, some behaviors of DTRs of the past come to light even early in that Oregon game. So how does he get back to that mindset of protecting the ball, trusting his progressions and reads, trusting plays to develop at the appropriate time and knowing when to keep it, when to hand it off, when to get his teammates involved and when to assert himself that he's done so beautifully against Washington and Utah. And so that's what I'm really looking for is that mindset, knowing that so much is still left to play. They're playing a Stanford team, Ryan, that's three and four, but they've won two games in a row. 
They started one and four, a disastrous start to the season for a team that honestly roster wise should be better than they are up until that particular point. They go to Notre Dame. They shock the Irish, win that game on the road, follow it up with just a wild win on the final play, second to last play of the game against Arizona State. Over the course of those two victories, Ryan, they've scored one touchdown and they've had eight field goals. And (laughs) it's just been a product of them not having their two leading rushers who are out for the season and their leading receiver is out for the season. So they're just very decimated right now. When you look at Christian Filkins, EJ Smith, Michael Wilson, all out for the season. So Tanner McKee is an NFL quality quarterback. He's going to have to rely more on uh, Elijah Higgins and Bryson Tremaine to try and get some things going. But they're a very proud team, a really good defense that's kind of kept them in games. So I'm, I'm excited to see the high octane UCLA offense with this Stanford team that wants to shorten the game, shorten the number of possessions and really sort of grind it out. And so which style ultimately prevails, especially early in the game, is going to be a real key factor for success in terms of how this game is going to be played. And here's the the kind of interesting thing, Jamal, that I don't know if it's a, a shift necessarily in Stanford, the way they operate. Obviously, those injuries you mentioned play a huge factor in this. But you look in those first, you know, four weeks or even five weeks when they were one in um, – you know, one and four, like you mentioned, and they were putting up, you know, I know their first game was against Colgate, but 41 in that game. And then they were at least averaging, you know, 22 plus points a game. And their defense was giving up 40 I and mean, they gave up 41 to SC, 40 to Washington, 45 to Oregon, and then 28 to Oregon state. And the two games since they've only scored 16 and 15, but they've only given up 14. So it's almost like the defense has said, okay, we see that there's these injuries on offense. Granted, they're playing, obviously, less high-octane offense. I mean, you look at USC, you look at Oregon, you look at Washington, those are three of the best offenses, not only in the conference, but in the country. So that plays a big factor in it. That's a substantial drop-off from 45 points to 16 points or 14 points that they've given up. So that is something that I'm going to be looking forward to see is, is if this UCLA offense struggles at all against this defense, if maybe this defense has – found their identity a bit after getting punched in the mouth, you know, four weeks in a row, if they've kind of woken up a little bit and said, okay, we should be better than what we are. And our offense does have these injuries. It's going to be us to us to step up and hold teams under 20. So I'm curious if UCLA, how they'll react to that. And I guess a question for you, and I'm not, I'm not calling you a Stanford expert, but you know a little bit about everything. Have you seen a reason why that is, or is it just the main fact that they're playing less high octane offenses? Ryan, it's a couple of things. I mean, we it's hard to believe this iteration of the Stanford offense. There were two plays away in that SC game from being 35 all at the half. At the half. You know, I mean, if we recall that EJ Smith fumble at the two-yard line and then Tanner McKee throws an interception from the two on fourth and goal, that was the difference in that first half against USC. Otherwise, we were headed for, you know, a 50-plus point game on either side. This team could really move the ball and score the ball. I think the injuries have played a a huge role. And when you talk about Filkins and Smith, I mean, you're talking about even to this day, over 90% of the rushing offense has gone for the season. When you talk about Michael Wilson being wide receiver number one, I mean, basically the equivalent of a Jordan Addison or a Jake Bobo being out for the season, it's really forced other guys to not only have to step up, but other defenses can just kind of key in on Tremaine, key in on Elijah Higgins, and really limit everything else. So that's what's contributed to the offense going down. But I think simultaneously, the defense has said, hey, we have a talented group of players, and we need to step up our game. And I've really seen three players from Stanford really emerge as stars over the last few weeks, Ryan. One is Stephen Heron, very talented defensive end, leads them in sacks, four and a half sacks, on the season and has really disrupted the line of scrimmage played a really key role in that Notre Dame game of keeping Notre Dame off balance and keeping Stanford in that game early, especially on the road in a very hostile environment. Then you've got Tobin Phillips, their defensive line stud two and a half sacks on the year, really their run stopper. And that's really, I think where Stanford has found mojo is the ability to stop the run. They did it very effectively against Notre Dame did it very effectively against Arizona State, who, oh, by the way, ran the ball pretty well against USC in the weeks earlier. And so seeing Tobin Phillips emerge 
has really helped Stanford stay in some of these games. And then their third great playmaker on the back end, Ryan, Patrick Fields, fourth on the team in tackles, but also can come in and be that striker that Quantrez Knight used to be for UCLA. He kind of plays that striker role from the safety position, and he's brought two sacks to the table. So these different looks that Stanford can provide by bringing pressure, not just from the defensive line perspective, but from level two and level three of the defense and tightening up the run game with some of these players emerge has really changed their style overnight, 180 from what it was. This year coming in, even when we talked to David Shaw, Ryan at Pac-12 Media Day, the expectation was Stanford was going to have no problem scoring the ball and they're finally getting more physical players a la in the Harbaugh years to do enough defensively to really stay in games. Now what we've seen is, yeah, those guys are really panning out at superstars. And if if Stanford only was healthy offensively, this team could have been a real juggernaut uh, moving forward into the season. So I think it's the injuries on offense and really the emergence of really high quality star players on defense has allowed them to do this and allowed David Shaw to sort of hang on by a thread uh, to not being potentially on the hot seat. If it was any other place, I think David Shaw would be much more on the hot seat than he is. Yeah, which is <clears throat> hard to think about with how good of a coach David Shaw is and how hard it is yeah. to build what they have built in Stanford. And I know it's been you know down years now. You know, rather I would not say consistently, but for a decent amount of time, which is why that that even conversation is coming up. But so looking at this game and looking inwardly to UCLA, and we saw we see this resurgence of the defense. We see these players stepping up. Does that is is there? I don't even want to use the word concern, but is there any thoughts as to can they slow this UCLA offense down, or is it you know what if UCLA plays their brand of football, which is what I believe, but I'll let you answer for yourself they shouldn't have any problem still putting up 35, 40 plus points in this one because of how they operate, because of how well they're able to move the football. As long as DTR does what DTR's done for five games or six games and not the seventh game, then we should be good to go. Zach Charbonnet, still Zach Charbonnet. If Jake Bobo, like we talked about last episode, can be more consistent from quarter one to quarter four, then really they're only beating themselves. No defense, let alone a Stanford defense that has played better these last two weeks, but it hasn't been great all year, is going to slow them down. Your thoughts on that, or does this defense actually pose a threat to this UCLA offense? Ryan, I think this defense can stop UCLA for a time, for you know, a a while, maybe half a quarter. I think what (laughs) what potentially could happen is I think Stanford's girth up front on the defensive line could make it challenging early for Charbonnet to get his yards. But then Chip Kelly does what Chip Kelly has done the last couple of weeks, which is then get Charbonnet the ball outside, run those pitches, run those options, get Keegan Jones going on the swing passes, stretch this defense out more horizontally, and then allow Charbonnet to pound through the middle of that line and then kick these runs out to the outside and then play off that to get Bobo the ball in key situations and then get Kaz Allen the ball in space and then take a shot alternatively with a Cam Brown and a Logan Loya and then the floodgates will open. So I anticipate Stanford maybe having a little bit of early success. It wouldn't surprise me if they came up with a stop or two early in the game. And then once UCLA provides the threat, both horizontally as you know, to start both through the air and on the ground, that'll open things up vertically. And then UCLA is going to be UCLA for the vast majority of this game. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. So let's get to, um, well, before we get to score predictions, got to mention, uh, sponsor the show, our friends at bet online, usually do the beginning. Let's throw it in the later part of the episode, head to betonline.ag today. Use the promo code believe that's B L E A V. It's going to get you a 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. You can bet on any slate of LA football games. You can bet on any game period. Obviously the world series, I was going to say kicks off. What do you say? Pitches off. It starts tonight. <laughs> um, NBA is uh, in full swing. Bunch of games to slate this weekend. NHL is back as well. My Avalanche are the reigning Stanley Cup champions. Kings, though, are back on ice. Anaheim Ducks are back on ice as well. So head to betonline.ag today. Promo code BELIEVE. That's B-L-E-A-V. And bet on any of these great sporting events. And hopefully you can win some money this weekend and continue that on for the future. So, 
Jamal, should we get into prediction time or is there any other matchups you wanted to kind of get into? No, let's do it, Ryan. I'm fired up to talk about the outcome here. All right. So I'll start, I guess, because I always give it to you first and I'll, uh, I'll start and then toss it over to you. Um, I talked about in our USC segment of the show that I thought Caleb Williams was going to have his best performance of the season after that tough loss in Utah. I'm going to double down on that. And I think DTR has his best performance of the season. I think yeah. he knows he left stuff out there against Oregon. Um, and again, it was not the offense's fault. They lost that game. The defense didn't stop anyone. But I think with how long DTR has been in this program, how long he's been in college football, the leadership that he has, the skill set he has, the amount of uh, how special this season is, how special this season is, not only for the UCLA football program, but for him on a personal level, whether that's a Heisman candidacy, whether that's potential NFL draft stock raising, he knows all of that. And he knows, unfortunately, there was a letdown in Eugene last week, albeit against a very good Oregon Ducks team. And I think he wants to come out and prove the nation. And I know they're playing a, a embattled Stanford team, but it's still Stanford. It's still a division rival or a conference rival wants to prove that they're not a fluke that they weren't a, even though two weeks out of three is not a fluke by any stretch of the imagination, but people will make that argument like, oh, okay, well, they lost to Oregon when it counted. They're a fluke. He wants to come out and prove they are not a fluke. He is not a fluke. He is absolutely a Heisman candidate. And I think he throws for 400 plus yards or, or 400 yards total. I'll say with rushing and passing and four to five touchdowns in this one to get UCLA back over that 40 point threshold. Um, Charbonnet probably has a great game as well. Per usual. I don't need to talk much about that. I think Bobo shows a little more consistency. And I think the defense more so because of the injuries of Stanford is able to look like their older defense, like they did against Colorado and whatnot, just when they're playing lesser talent, they will be opportunistic. I still think Stanford probably gets 17 points on the board in this one, but I think it'll be a 42, 45, 17 like game, but I think it was the exact score of the, the Colorado game. So big win for UCLA as they get back in the win column, but a huge game for DTR statistically, morally, and uh, emphatically standing his name back in the Heisman conversation. I love it, Ryan. I love I love the enthusiasm, the focus. I mean, you've got DTR and Caleb combining for a thousand yards and eleven touchdowns on on Saturday. So I'm I'm fired up to see how that shakes out because that would be maybe the greatest uh, college quarterback Saturday in the history of Los Angeles. Uh, you know, so we we yes, could sir. be on the cusp of that, and I, and I love to hear it, and I wish it happened. Um, you know, for me, Ryan, I think we're on the same page in terms of outcome. I think we may be on the disagreeing end of how we get there. I think that Chip is going to play psychologist a little bit uh, for tomorrow. I think, A, there is a tremendous amount of mutual respect between Chip Kelly and David Shaw. That, that story doesn't get told enough nationally. But B, this is year five of the Chip DTR relationship. And I think Chip, much in the way of Phil Jackson – knew how to push Jordan and Pippen and Shaq and Kobe's buttons. I think Chip knows the right buttons to press with DTR. And I think Chip being the strategic thinker that he is, kind of that chess mind that he is, understands it's not about having DTR peak this week. It's a a three-week process to get DTR to peak for that SC game. In much in the way we had DTR sort of start a little bit slowly at the start of the year and then kind of find his way a little bit against Colorado and then peak against Utah and Washington, I think he's setting up that curve once again. And so I think for that reason, he also knows DTR, the competitor that he is, the fiery uh, athlete that he is. DTR reminds me a lot of another UCLA great in terms of mentality and mindset. He sort of footballs Russell Westbrook in a lot of ways. And so, you know, he takes things personally. He really sort of, he's a, he's a coil of energy and he wants to let it all loose. And I think Chip is smart enough to know, I don't want him to try and do too much this week because I know he's coming off the loss. I know he wants to make it all up and really just get them back immediately to where they were. And I think he's going to be missing the forest for the trees if he, if he does that. And I think that's how he's thinking. I want this to be a three-week progression for him to peak in that SC game to really be set up for success in the Pac-12. And for that reason, I think this is going to be more of a Charbonnet game. 
I see Charbonnet going for 150 plus and two touchdowns. I think DTR is going to be great, but I think DTR is going to be in kind of that 225, two touchdowns, no interceptions, very clean, another 60 plus yards rushing, kind of a 285 total yards and two touchdowns. So it's going to be a great game, but he's not going to necessarily go nuts with it. I think Stanford also has a lot of experience and David Shaw in particular in terms of personnel and matching up against high octane offenses. David Shaw went head to head with Chip in those great Stanford Oregon battles in the early to mid 2010s. He knows how to kind of take the air out of the ball against the Chip Kelly offense and try and slow the game down. So as a result of that, I think the game is going to be a little bit slower than we think. I think UCLA prevails comfortably. They're going to win by 15, but they're going to win 31-16 in a lower scoring game than I think people expect. Charbonnet is going to do his thing. DTR is going to be great, but I think this is going to now be step one of three to get DTR to be peaking for that SC game. Because truth be told, Ryan, you don't need A-plus DTR to win four of the next five games, but you need A-plus DTR to win that SC game. And I think Chip's mind is all now all about how do I get DTR at an A-plus level on November 19th? Not on October 30th, not on November 6th, not on November 12th or 13th, but November 19th. And I think this is the first step in rebuilding that narrative and that mindset. Yeah, well said. Uh, Either way, big win for UCLA. Gets back in the win column, would push them to 7-1 and if it does come to fruition. Um, they're ranked 12th in the country right now. I assume, I don't know if they'd move up with that win, but they'll definitely stay pat. I would assume. So big one or big game. I should say at the Rose bowl, seven 30 kickoff. We'll have coverage for you here at the LA football network with that. Jamal, anything else you need to add or are we good to wrap this thing up? Well, I hope the, the fans pack the Rose bowl. It's an evening game. There's no yes. sun. No worry about sunburn. This is a great football team, 12th in the country, who, you know, and an opportunity to go 7-1 and one going into November and be favored in three of the four remaining games. I mean, so for fans to really kind of think about that, all UCLA has to do is win the games they're supposed to. Let's just put that SC game aside for a second, and they're going to tie the school record for single-season wins at 10 with at least an opportunity to break that in one bowl game and possibly a conference championship game. And if they beat SC regular season, they're going to break that record with a chance for so much more. So, so much on the line. This is going to be one of the most exciting months of November in the history of UCLA football and certainly the recent history of UCLA football. Let's pack the Rose Bowl. Let's support this team. And let's see what the magic that they can do over the course of the next four or five weeks. Exactly. Well said. 7.30 Rose Bowl. We'll see you all there Saturday night. Go Bruins. Should be a fun one. We'll talk to you guys all next week for some recaps. Make sure to like and subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts, Apple, Spotify, Google Play, on YouTube, uh, LAFB Network, or the website LAFBnetwork.com. For Jamal Madney, I'm Ryan Dyer. Thank you all. Enjoy the game. Talk to you next week. Peace.